Good afternoon, Crestone. There we go. Okay, that's my name. Um, honored to be here at the, what is this, the 33rd annual, 34th, okay, 34th annual Crestone Energy Fair. I uh, want to give a shout out to Anya Katz, who had invited me to be here. Uh, she's someone I connected with a couple of years back, was on her podcast, and I've been meaning to get down to Crestone for some time, so this was kind of a perfect excuse to do so. Um, so who am I? I'm, I'm with the Savory Institute, uh, as you probably heard in my intro. Um, uh, show of hands, who is familiar with Alan Savory's work, maybe has seen his TED Talk? We got a couple people there. Land Institute shirt, love it. Wes Jackson, good man. Um, okay, so some people familiar, some not. So I'm going to cover a variety of different topics today. We'll see if I have an hour to fill. If not, think of some questions. We can have some Q&A at the end. But the Savory Institute that I work for, um, we are a nonprofit organization, 501c3, and our work focuses specifically on global grasslands. Um, if you look at the Earth's surface, of the land surface, about a third of the Earth's land surface is forested, you know, kind of like where we are here. We're in a little bit of an alpine forest, you know, a mostly it's a predominantly wooded area. Another third of the Earth's surface is covered in grass. So this would be grasslands, rangelands, savanna, prairies, steppes, the pampas, you know, whatever region it is you're in in the world. And then the last third is covered by ice or desert. So at Savory, we focus on the grass-dominated landscapes because it is such a large landscape, one third of the Earth's terrestrial surface. Yet in environmental conversations, what you often hear is a lot of discussion around tree planting. And not to say that there is anything wrong with tree planting. Obviously, if a landscape is meant to be wooded, yes, let's get a good diversity of species growing there and have a different age structure and different succession and have them spread out and cared for properly. But in native rangeland, there is significant ecosystem service and benefit that is given to not just us humans, but to all other species on the planet. There are, you know, so uh, grasslands represent about 12 and a half billion acres worldwide, just to put that in scale. Um, there are about two billion people whose day-to-day -day livelihoods are dependent directly on grasslands. There is the production of food and fiber for much of our agricultural practices, which is where a lot of our work focuses on. Grasslands provide wildlife habitat. They're actually the most species-rich habitat on the planet, more so than tropical rainforests. That's something that I think a lot of people don't necessarily realize. You know, you see tropical rainforests, you see all the, the birds and, you know, all the the beautiful critters running around there, and you think that's the epitome of what everything should be. But a third of the Earth's surface is actually just wide open, fragile landscapes that are home to tons and tons of species. Whether we're talking the herbivores that are roaming uh, across the soil surface and grazing the grasses, or we're talking about ground nesting birds, or the birds and the butterflies, or the earthworms, or the billions of microbes that exist in a teaspoon of soil and everything else down there in the soil food web. It's just an incredibly important, critical, yet underappreciated and undervalued ecosystem. And so that's what our work is. And what we do at the Savory Institute is we work with those people that are closest to the soil surface. And that is going to look like three different groups of people. So we're working with farmers, we're working with ranchers, and we're working with pastoralist communities. So ranchers are pretty self-explanatory, big, open range, large, her large herds of livestock, whether that be cows or bison, sheep, goats, etc. Farming, that's gonna be more in a uh, context where you are growing different forms of uh, 
crops and animals and all integrated into one system. And then pastoralism, that's more uh, looking at regions of the world where there is communal land ownership. And so there isn't necessarily delineation of this is my land, this is your land, this is people who own animals because that's how they store their wealth, that's where they get their food and their fiber from, that's where they get most everything that they have in life and they herd their animals throughout the day and then they pen them up and keep them close by at night. And so we work with these different communities around the world and help them to be the best land stewards that they can be. Um, there's this quote from a evolutionary biologist in an essay, uh, I think it was in 73, the guy's name is Theodosius Dobzhansky, and he said, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. And that, I think, underpins a lot of what explains the work we do and why it is what we do and how it is what we do. When we are looking to manage biological systems, in our case, grasslands, what did that look like from an evolutionary perspective? Now, we won't be able to replicate that exactly. There's not a romanticized version of the past that we're trying to bring into a modern context and say, hey, we need to all go back to being hunter-gatherers wearing loincloths or whatever that may be, but there are certain clues in our evolutionary history that we can apply in the modern context. Now, we could go back 10,000 years and look at the dawn of the agricultural revolution and look at how things have changed since then. For example, we could go and study the, the landscapes and the cultures uh, and the land management styles of Mesopotamia and see what has happened there in the Fertile Crescent over the last 10,000 years. Um, but I think a, a more telling and more recent uh, example to look at is the one that's closest to us, both in terms of location and timeline. And that would be, how did our Great Plains, how did North America exist in recent history. And we can go back about four or 500 years ago and look at the most recent accounts, and we know that when, around when the Europeans arrived to North America, there used to be somewhere around 60 to 75 million bison roaming across North America. And so that was coast to coast, Canada to Mexico, big, huge, massive herds of bison roaming about. Now, Bison, because they are grazing herbivores, they are used to their pack hunting predators. So that would be the wolves in most cases. So bison would stay in these tightly bunched herds and they would move about. The accounts that you get from the early Europeans who arrived here would say that when they first came across these herds of bison, in some instances these herds were so large that it didn't just take a few minutes for the herd to move across the landscape in front of them. Sometimes it would take days these herds were so large. We're talking not just thousands, but tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of animals all together, these thundering hooves moving across North America. And what that did is that created the landscape that we know that eventually became the wheat belt. That's where our three feet of rich, dark topsoil that we have been extracting from for the last couple hundred of years came from. It came from these animals roaming across our lands. And so the bison would stay tightly bunched, they would graze their grasses, their urine and dung would be deposited onto the land acting like a, n a natural fertilizer, and then they would move on to fresh pastures. And they wouldn't return back to a same piece of land, really. Test, test. Yep. Um, microphone problem. I think we lost a battery. So I was saying the bison, they would roam across these landscapes. They would graze 
the land, and then they wouldn't return until the grasses had fully recovered. And that right there is a critical piece, the recovery. You know, after a, a really hard workout, you know, they say that the workout isn't where you get stronger. It's actually the recovery after a workout. That's when you get stronger, so you really need to rest after a hard workout. The same thing can be said with grazing. After a grazing event on a landscape, it's the recovery period where the landscape gets stronger. That's where the perennial grasses deepen their roots. That's where more photosynthesis is actively happening. Microphone switch, right, back to this one, okay. Um, and that's where photosynthesis is happening. When you are stimulating the regrowth of new grasses, what you're doing is you are encouraging more photosynthesis to be happening. You're optimizing the amount of solar energy that can be captured and converted through chlorophyll into sugars that then feed the soil food web. And that soil food web is a host to all kinds of living beings. You know, there's mycelium that is deep underground, and the mycelium is down there with their channels, and they are weathering rocks, pulling minerals up and exchanging that for the carbohydrates at the root tip. And so there's this underground soil commerce system that's happening where minerals and sugars and life is all being exchanged in these symbiotic relationships. And it all happens because of the stimulation that's happening at the soil surface when that grazing herbivore takes a bite of that grass and then enough recovery time is given so that it can grow back to health. So that's kind of how things used to look across North America. That's how the land used to be healthy. But things obviously look a little bit different now. You know, much of our agriculture, much of our land management these days is industrial. And it looks nothing like what it used to. Soil organic matter used to be probably around 5% in most places, and I think in most agricultural soils now, it's down to less than a percent, probably less than half a percent. And so that's really the, where the fertility, that's where the production of food and fiber comes from. And so all of the, the life-giving potential from the ground beneath our feet has really just withered away over the years. Um, there's an example that I think is relevant. So the, the way that we work at the Savory Institute is we, we work with these farmers and ranchers and pastoralists, and we have learning hubs all around the world that are helping local farming communities adapt these methods uh, into a local context. Uh, one of the hubs is a farm named White Oak Pastures down in Bluffton, Georgia, down in the deep south, um, not, not too far from the Gulf of Mexico, down in the southwest corner of Georgia. Um, Will Harris runs this farm and he is the fourth generation. You know, back when his great-great-grandfather was running the farm, it was a, a small cattle operation that was feeding the local community of Bluffton, Georgia. And that's all it really needed to do. That's all you really could do before refrigeration and all these sorts of other pieces allowed us to develop global supply chains. Every supply chain was local back then. But as time went on, that evolved. They scaled up. And then Will tells this story about how his father, back in uh, around the time of World War II, a little bit after the war, one day a, a, a salesman comes to town and he gets all the farmers together. He, you know, he hosts a fish fry and he's like, all right, guys, everyone come, to, come together. I'm going to tell you about this, this new invention that's going to change your lives. What I have here is fertilizer. And it's all, we, we figured it out. All you need to grow healthy plants is nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium, NPK. That's all you need is these three things. And we put those three things into this bag right here. And this is the fertilizer. And what I want you to do is when you go home, just take this bag, sprinkle it onto some of your land, you know, just a little patch of land, just sprinkle, you know, the bag was maybe this big. Not too much. Sprinkle it, water it, and come back in a couple days and see what's changed. So Will's dad's like, all right, yeah. Sure, let's see what happens. So he sprinkles it, and he waters it, and he comes back a couple days later. Grass was two, three times taller. It was greener. It was like, oh, my God. 
This is the answer to all of my prayers. I need this on every inch of my land. Because if I can grow more grass faster, quicker, well, shoot, like my life is a lot easier. I can, I can raise more animals, I can feed more people, I can be more profitable, you know, there will be more jobs in my community, all these sorts of things. So, yeah, all right, let's do it. Well, I think in hindsight, we now understand the problem with that. You know, a couple decades later, we come to realize that the complexity of soil is more than just three different nutrients. There is so much more to it. And synthetic fertilizer, as it turns out, nukes the microbiome of the soil. So all these people that thought they had found this magic fairy dust that was going to solve all of their problems, a couple decades later, their land is getting poorer and poorer and poorer in health, and it's getting harder and harder to have the same type of output that you used to have. And so this is where that soil fertility that used to be so rich in these black soils that made up the wheat belt, how they've became this lifeless dirt that now is decimating rural economies and it is destroying wildlife habitat and it is causing the soil, which normally should act like a sponge, you know, soil is essentially a sponge. And so when rain falls on it, it should be absorbed into the soil so that you can hold it, so that in times of drought, you've got a water reserve. Or if you experience a significant rain event and you get, say, three inches of rain in an hour, instead of it causing a huge flooding, that soil is there ready to absorb it all, soak it up as a sponge. That's what healthy soils are supposed to do. But for that to happen, you need to have fertility in the soil. And so when we kill off the fertility of our soils, not just are we depleting our ability to grow food and fiber for everyone that eats, which is all of us, but we're ruining all these other critical aspects of what the land provides to us and all other living beings. The, the problem being is that, you know, that NPK fertilizer that he was given, it seemed like a good idea at the time, but there are unintended consequences. And often that's what happens when we're dealing with living systems, is there are unintended consequences when we think we have found a shortcut or an easy answer. You know, as humans, and I think if anyone who listened to Jake and Marin's talk yesterday uh, over at the, the cloud, stage uh, heard about, we as human beings are a tool using species. You know, for all of our history, we have been trying to figure out more ways to make our lives easier. I mean, go and read Chris's book, Civilized to Death, and you'll see all the different ways in which modernity and civilization has changed life, often not for the better, in the agricultural context that is most definitely the case. You know, from a context of, hey, we figured out how to make fire, this allows us to cook and get access to more nutrients, or we figured out how to make tools that allow us to do certain things, that tool using aspect of who we are as humans has been quite helpful, and it has led to the ability to make things like airplanes and smartphones and all of these things that many of us rely on um, and couldn't get around with on a day-to-day -day basis. The problem being is that when you apply this mechanized way of thinking to living systems, the unintended consequences continually creep up and they amass and they run out of control. There's a, a really good book by David Montgomery called Dirt, The Erosion of Civilizations, where it looks at how land management and how great civilizations of the past have come and gone due to their mismanagement of their natural resources. And I think it's a very pertinent book because it definitely uh, is a mirror for us to be looking at in terms of where we are headed, uh, in terms of how we manage our agricultural lands. The aspect of being a tool-using species has been quite helpful for complicated systems, 
complicated machines, things like I said, airplanes, uh, smartphones, et cetera, you know, engines of a car. We can figure those things out, but when it comes to a living and breathing being, that same line of thinking doesn't quite work as well. You know, I was, um, my training is as a biomedical engineer. I used to work for the Food and Drug Administration. I used to regulate cardiovascular devices and uh, design clinical trials and, you know, all that sort of stuff. And so it was drilled in really hard to me, this biomedical model of, okay, let's look at the human body and let's break it down into the different systems. Okay, we've got the skeletal system and the circulatory system, et cetera, et cetera. And let's break it down into smaller pieces. Okay, we've got different organs and they do, this one does this and this one does that. Okay, and let's break it down even further. Let's look at the cellular level. Okay, let's look at these pieces. Let's look at the microbiome level. Okay, this bacteria does this thing. You know, we keep taking it down into smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller pieces. And the reason we are doing that is because we're trying to understand the infinite complexity of the human body. And we're trying to understand how it is, not just can we understand it, but can we control it. You know, we are trying to prevent disease in many cases, or we're addressing symptoms of diseases that have already occurred. And so breaking things down into these smaller pieces can be helpful in some contexts, but ultimately, the human body is infinitely complex, and no matter how much we try to break the human body down into smaller and smaller pieces, getting down to the atomic level, there are still going to be unknown qualities that we will never understand how it works. I mean, look at quantum physics. There's so many pieces of that that we're still trying to, to wrap our heads around and say, wait, but I thought that that's how this worked, but when you look at it at the quantum level, it doesn't actually work. So are the laws of physics only applicable between these certain boundaries? Or is it that science and our scientific understanding of living systems is limited? Because science itself is a conduit for trying to understand the infinite complexity. And ultimately, we will never understand that infinite complexity. So I've had to do a lot of unlearning of my biomedical upbringing. I've come to realize and, and see through the work I do at Savory, but also in you know, personal health and you know, spiritual practices and whatever it may be, that there is a lot more to it than this reductionist view of trying to understand and control the world. There's a surrender that needs to happen where we say, I cannot control with absolute authority everything that is going to happen in my life or everything that is going to happen on my landscape. That's the, so the opposite of a complicated system, you know, these mechanical systems, these machines, we're good at controlling those. Living systems that are complex, we are not so good at controlling those. We will never be able to control those. And so what do we do with living systems? What's the right solution if we can't control them? Well, we need to manage them holistically. We need to work with them. We need to understand the interconnectedness of all the different pieces of that system and acknowledge that a, a living and breathing entity contains a mind of its own because it is comprised of other entities. You know, whereas a machine, if a part breaks, that machine stops working. You can replace that cog in the machine and it'll start working again. The human body or an ecosystem or a landscape or uh, a society or a financial institution, you know, anything that's comprised of living beings, if something breaks in that system, it is going to self-organize and course correct. You know, you get a cut on your skin, your body is going to heal, heal it over. Now, there's some things we can do to s speed that up. We can, you know, maybe put, you know, some sort of salve on it. You want to get a right, the right amount of airflow onto, you know, your wound so that it heals properly. And the same thing can be said for our landscapes. We may not be able to determine exactly what is going to happen on a landscape, but we can understand the patterns of what makes a healthy landscape. And so, let's see, 
Yeah, go for it. So the question is, uh, mm -hmm. the question is, what do I think of bioengineering as it relates to food products? For example, Cheerios and you know the food we're ingesting. Yeah, uh, I think there's a lot of human hubris involved in thinking that we understand all of it. I think there will always be the unknown, no matter how much we try to understand. And because there will always be pieces we try to unknown. There, there will always be the unknown that we cannot figure out. I think it's best to look at what were the patterns of health historically from an evolutionary perspective, and then how can we replicate that in the modern context. So I personally don't like, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, mm -hmm. All right. So. No, it's all good. A little derailed, but let's get back on track. So this mechanistic thinking that is so dominant in us as humans that has allowed us to evolve to where we are today in our modern context, it has brought us to the point of applying that thinking to our agricultural practices. And just like the fertilizer salesman who was telling Will's father that, hey, all you need is to put this on your land, and that kind of was the, the boom of the industrial agricultural era and you know the disaster that we've seen happen over the last couple decades. It's led to monocultures. It's monocultures of, of thought where everyone is thinking the same thing. It's led to monocultures of cows in feedlots. It's led to monocultures of cornfields that are sprayed with glyphosate. It's this thinking that if you reduce it down just to a few variables, you control those variables, you know exactly what's going into the system, you know exactly what's going out, to, out of the system. But the reality is that we don't know that. We can't control that. And so from a holistic perspective, we need to shift our mindset from control to one of more being in a dance with nature, understanding what it is that nature wants, and then listening to its signals to say, oh, okay, I tried this, and then the landscape responded in this way. How can I adapt what I'm doing in a certain context? So what does this look like in you know, uh, practical terms for a farmer or a rancher, uh, the people that we work with? Well, the thing that we are most known for at the Savory Institute is our grazing planning. So working with farmers and ranchers teaching them how to better graze their animals, their herds of livestock, in a way that instead of degrading and destroying the land is going to help regenerate the ecosystem function and grow more grass and allow for a healthier landscape, healthier animals, and healthier community. The piece is there, I won't get into all of it, but essentially there's a planning procedure where just like the bison used to bunch up and move about, well, you can replicate that in a modern context. You can bunch your animals up with portal, portable electric fencing. You can use permanent fencing. You can herd on horseback or by foot or by four-wheeler. Um, I was actually uh, helping work our bison recently, and <laughs> I was very glad. You actually, uh, just a small anecdote, you don't want to manage bison on horseback. And there's a reason for that, because bison are faster than horses. And so that's why you want to manage bison on four-wheeler if you can. So we were bringing the bison. We work them once a year to do preg checks and to sort them and put ear tags on calves and stuff like that. And so I was on the tail end of the herd with my four-wheeler, you know, bringing them into the corrals. A lot of dust kicked up. I couldn't really see exactly what was going on in front of me, but the dust starts to settle a little bit, and I see that the herd has done a 180, and they are charging directly at me. Um, 
So in that instance, I was very glad that we had made the decision not to manage our animals on horseback and that I had a four-wheeler that did not have a regulator on it and so it could get to a top speed that was faster than a bison's top speed. So, you know, I pulled a hard turn, gunned it as fast as I could, and I got away, thankfully, but uh, that was definitely a harrowing experience. So it is to say that managing animals with a mind of their own you ultimately don't know what's going to happen, but you just need to be able to respond accordingly. You know, we eventually got them back into the corrals, and, you know, everyone is safe, but, you know, there are different factors to consider there. So, I was saying, to get the same herd effect that the bison used to have in North America, and I, I speak a lot about bison just because I'm using that um, that example from North America, but you can also look at the great wildebeest migration across Africa and all the different herbivores that are there, or, you know, every continent has mega herbivores and predators, and that dynamic is the same. There is that predator-prey connection, and there are those migratory patterns of herbivores across a landscape. And so you can bunch the animals up, and then you can move them. Um, you can also calculate what are the proper recovery rates needed for the specific grass species on your landscape. Because if you know that you want the perennial grasses to establish on your landscape, you are going to favor them in how you plan your grazing recovery periods. And so that's one of the factors that we teach farmers to do. Bunch your animals up, move them according to a grazing plan, We've got a list of calculations that you can do to figure out, okay, this is the proper recovery period for your landscape. This is the proper density to have your animals at. This is the amount of forage so that you can match the size of your herd to the amount of vegetation that's growing on the landscape. But ultimately, you know, the grazing is just one piece. The grazing is nothing without the proper mindset of the farmer or the rancher. That's really the paradigm shift that we focus most of our work on. And it's a decision-making framework. When you're managing complex living beings that have a mind of their own that you can't control, you can't say the end point is going to be over here and these are the 10 steps I'm going to take to get from A to B. It doesn't work like that. So instead, you have to shift focus and say, well, what is it that I want in life? What is, what is my North Star? What do I want my business to look like? What do I want my land to look like? What do I want my quality of life to look like? You, know, you try to factor in as many of the components as possible. Try to get as holistic of a picture of your future resource base. And then you have that and you articulate it and you clarify it down to the specific, well, clarify it as much as possible without having specifics. So you don't wanna say, I wanna live in this location or I wanna have this type of animal. But it's better to say, I want a quality of life that allows me the freedom to do X, Y, and Z, and I want you know, life to feel like this, and I want my landscape to be teeming with life and rivers running clean and you know, healthy animals, and I want to be financially um, comfortable, and you know, all these other pieces, and you factor that all in. And then, as I was saying, that adaptability being so important with complex systems, of being able to be in that dance with nature and say, okay, I tried this, did it move me in the direction I wanted to go? Mm, nope, it didn't quite, so let me course correct and get back to, get back more in line with my North Star. Okay, and then I'm moving a little, bit. Oh, I'm veering away, let's, let's course correct. So feedback loops are incredibly important in complex systems, and the tighter the feedback loop, the more you're going to be able to stay on track. You know, it's the same thing if you're someone who doesn't really have good management of your finances. You just kind of spend willy-nilly, and you're like, yeah, it'll be fine. And then you go and you look at your bank statement you know, a year or two years later, and you're like, whoa, I, I way overspent. I really got out of line. But if you were looking at those on a more regular basis, you know, say once a week you checked in and you were saying, hey, what's, what's been my spending? You know, how much revenue has come in? Are we moving in the right direction? You can course correct with smaller adjustments rather than waiting so long. And so when dealing with living systems with farmers and ranchers, you get them to articulate that North Star of what they want in life, what they want their landscape to look like, and then give them a set of questions that allows them to have that feedback loop 
of am I moving in the right direction with all the different things I'm doing? And these types of questions are looking at, you know, uh, am I getting the greatest marginal reaction for the resources that I'm spending? So say I, you know, okay, we have a surplus of funds and we're going to reinvest that back into our farming operation. Well, do we, uh, do we buy new fencing or do we get a new walk-in cooler or are we going to get uh, a new milking parlor or whatever it may be? There's no right answer, but if you ask yourself these questions of, you know, what is the most sustainable use of my money, where is the greatest marginal reaction for where I can be um, putting my resources, you know, what's your gut feel? That's an important one that I think is important to honor that we include in our set of testing questions. It allows someone not just to evaluate the actions that they're taking so we're not just you know, chasing the shiny thing all the time, which we as humans have a tendency to do, but it's reminding them of, no, 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 this is your North Star that you articulated. You want to stay on this course, so make sure that you're taking actions that are moving you in that direction. And if you continually do that, as time goes on, you're going to be caring for the land ecologically, caring for those ecosystem processes, going to be moving, doing so in a way that is financially profitable for the land manager, which is an incredibly important piece that I think a lot of people leave out. They think it's just about the practices that you're doing on the land, and they forget that if it, it's not a sustainable thing, if you can't make a living on it, ultimately you're not going to do it for very long, so it has to be financially viable for someone to do. And socially, is it something that gives people life, it gives them meaning in what they're doing, it gives them the quality of life that allows them to interact with their family or to be able to take a vacation even. You know, most farmers are so overworked that they're not able to do that. But with careful planning and by, by mapping things out and asking these sorts of questions, they can build that type of life that they want, they just need to be more proactive about it. And it's not something that's hard to do, it's just so many people are are stuck in their ways of, well, this is the way that it's always been done, you know? My parents did it, my grandparents did it, and so on and so forth, and so I'm just carrying on the legacy. So, well, if it worked for them, it should work for me, so I'm just, you know, put my head down and work hard. And that may have worked for a period of time, but people make mistakes, you know? People start putting fertilizer on the land that nukes the microbiome, and we lose the soil fertility that used to give the productivity that allowed people to do these sort of things. And so now farmers are existing on razor-thin margins, whereas they used to be much more profitable in what they were able to do. And the most important piece of all of this, whether it's the grazing planning or the decision-making or whatever it is, is it has to be done in context. You know, the way that we manage bison at our at Savory Institute's bison ranch in the front range is going to be different than the way gauchos are doing it in Patagonia and it's going to be different than the way the Maasai are doing it in Kenya and it's going to be different from the Sami reindeer herders in Norway and it's going to be different from the nomadic herders in Mongolia. All of these contexts are incredibly different but they all have that same common thread that we're talking about grasslands and grazing herbivores, and there's some inherent truths to it. I see a hand raised over here. Mm -hmm. So the question is, uh, I've been talking about bison a bunch. Um, is what I'm talking about applicable to other types of grazing herbivores, and yes, absolutely, they are interchangeable, whether we're talking bison or cattle, sheep, goats, reindeer, elk, mule deer, these are all grazing animals on grass. The same concepts apply across the board. It's just up to the context of the individual. You know, some people like bison. There's this, you know, romantic view of bison on the Great Plains that people want to be close to. And in our context, the ranch, when it was donated to our organization, they had bison on it. So we've, we've kept with that. But we could just as easily sell off the bison herd and bring in a cattle herd. And it would actually be a little easier to manage. They don't run as fast, so, you know, we wouldn't need all of those four-wheelers. Um, but also, your fencing infrastructure doesn't need to be as much. Bison, you have to have much sturdier infrastructure because they are much stronger, much wilder animals. 
And so you have to have taller fence. The posts need to be closer together. You need to have more substantial corrals and squeeze chutes and all those sort of things that when you work them. So you know, there's different pros and cons, and there's no right answer. Um, I know people that are out grazing sheep because they are easier to manage. They're smaller animals. You know, it's less dangerous. You can transport them easier. Um, you know, financially, they might be able to make better margins off sheep than they will on certain cattle, depending on where you are um, and what your local markets are. Um, but yeah, there's no right answer. What was your second question? I'm sorry. Mm. Yeah, do we go out to ranchers or do they come? Yeah. We absolutely do not go knocking on people's doors saying, hey, what you're doing is wrong and I have a better way. Uh, because that never, ever, ever works. <laughs> it would be great if that worked because my job would be a lot easier. Um, but what we do is we wait for people to come to us. And that's why we have that global network of learning hubs. We've got about 50 of them uh, on, in about 30 different countries across six continents. And so they are all locally owned and locally led learning centers. So it's not you know, the Savory Institute, the 15 people headquartered in Boulder that are coming and telling the Maasai in Kenya how to manage their cattle. It is Kenyans that are working with the Maasai herders who are peers who have come to us for training and accreditation and we have taught them everything that we know and we have helped them develop business plans and ways to create impact in a region and encouraged them to do so in a way that is contextually relevant. Um, so all of our savory hubs look different. Uh, some of them are for-profit entities where it is pure training and workshops where you know they're hosting week-long trainings that they're charging farmers a couple thousand dollars for because they've got the money for it. Um, and they offer land monitoring services to be able to provide reports on what's the ecosystem health of your landscape. We've got nonprofit entities that are more uh, supported by philanthropy and the support of their local communities and volunteer work. Then we even have some academic institutions uh, like Michigan State University, or actually even the Colorado Savory Hub is based out of Western State College out in Gunnison. Um, so that is called the Colorado Regenerative Network. So anyone out there who manages land or livestock and is interested in learning more, there is a local savory hub, you know, not too far away, up in Gunnison. So I'd encourage you to check them out. The thing about contextually applying these practices, though, and adapting towards, you know, the locality, whether it's the, the, the local type of soil or the local politics or the weather or the markets or the culture, whatever it may be, is that there is no one size fits all solution to how this is done. It looks different in every single context. Um, and grazing is just one tool in the toolkit. You know, we in the holistic management framework teach of different tools that can be applied. You know, you can use animals as a tool, you can use fire as a tool, you can use your human ingenuity as a tool. Rest is a tool. If you intentionally say, I'm going to leave this land alone, that is a choice you make. And all of these are choices that are in a land manager's toolbox. You know, they have the choice to do any of these things. You know, there's the, the grazing planning. There's uh, no-till agriculture. There's cover crops. There's application of compost. There's biochar. There's chop and drop, centropic agriculture, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's so many different ways in which you can influence a landscape. And there's no right way and there's no wrong way, but there are some inherent patterns of truth as to what a landscape needs um, and the ecosystem function that you're trying to improve. So I see that you have a microphone as well with a question. Sure. Thank you. Um, my name is Sarah Soul. I Hi. really like a lot of what you're saying is really making a lot of sense to me, so thank you. And um, I'm currently looking at purchasing a small ranch, mm -hmm. like on the order of 10, 20, maybe 40 acres. Mm -hmm. I'd really like to have goats and chickens. I already have a couple horses. My question is, 
with the grazing plan that you're speaking about and these different techniques, is it possible for me to have like a really healthy grassland little system on my little 10, 20, 40 acres? Um, or what does that scale look like? Like how important is the larger landscape? Mm -hmm. um, there's all of these different rectangles owned by different people yeah. in this grassland, in this ecosystem. Um, is it possible for me to have my own little healthy rectangle? Mm -hmm. How important is the bigger picture? Yeah, it's a really good question, and it's one that we get a lot. Um, I will say that the planned grazing is easier at slightly larger scales than that. Not, not too big. I'm not saying that you have to have thousands of acres for it to be successful, but there are some efficiencies of scale that happen. You know, for example, a, a farm of 500 acres versus a farm of a ranch of you know, 50,000 acres is going to take about the same amount of labor in terms of you know, people that are out there checking on fence, checking on watering points, you know, bring in extra staff when you work the animals in the fall. Um, or during calving season, whatever it may be. But generally, you know, your labor costs are going to be mostly fixed. And so, you know, as your herd grows, so does your profitability and what you're able to do on that landscape. At the smaller scales, it gets a little trickier, though it's not impossible. Um, I would definitely lean more towards the smaller framed animals, like sheep or goats. Maybe even rabbits could be something to consider. Those are much smaller. I've, I know someone who has done the grazing planning with rabbits. Um, the thing is, it's, it goes back to your context of not just how do you regenerate ecosystem function, but what is it that you want out of managing your land? Is it that you want to make it as thriving and abundant of a landscape as possible, no matter the cost, and you're willing to sink a lot of resources into it and time? Does the does the beauty of it matter to you where you don't want to see uh, fences put up or maybe you don't want to be out there moving your small little micro herd of whatever animals you have? You don't want to be out there moving them every day or twice a day or whatever it is according to your grazing plan. Um, those are some of the questions that are going to be important in figuring out what should you do, what's the right uh, thing to do. Um, in smaller contexts, I've, um, I've noticed that a lot of people will gravitate more towards permaculture practices where there's more terraforming of the land, you know, creating swales uh, or hugel culture um, or, you know, having the, the different crops mixed in with uh, animals. And the permaculture approach works particularly well when you're talking those you know smaller amounts of acreage, and it and the inverse is true that permaculture becomes more difficult the larger you get because there is a lot more manual labor in the initial setup of doing some of that terraforming of the landscape. And so I've seen really productive landscapes where there are, yeah, you know, gardens and orchards and animals all integrated together, and it requires a decent amount of manual labor to maintain it. But the outcome is usually self-sufficient if that's the goal that you're looking for, is for self-sufficiency and beauty and just to be surrounded by life. You can apply those permaculture principles using the decision-making framework of holistic management. And you could even bring in the grazing planning piece of it if you wanted to. There's plenty of people that we work with. Actually, even some of our savory hubs are permaculture folks with tons of experience in that world, but they've just gravitated naturally more towards the livestock side of things because, you know, that tickles their fancy. So did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Great. We have another question. Sure. Chris. Hey. Uh, I wonder if you could just say a few words about Alan Savory and the experiences that he had that led to the institute that you work for. Yeah. Great question. Um, and Chris actually had the honor of speaking with Alan at the, uh, on the TED main stage in 2013. So, you know, we've got some, some royalty in the crowd here. Um, so Alan Savory 
is a, uh, he's Rhodesian, uh, so Rhodesia is now Zimbabwe and Zambia, and he was a rangeland ecologist, so he studies the land uh, in Rhodesia. He now is 87 years old, and he splits his time between Zimbabwe and the U.S., um, but he's someone that grew up believing that livestock were the ultimate problem for a landscape, that animals in general were destroying the landscape. And if you wanted to do what is right for the land, you needed to get animals off of that landscape. In Alan's context, in the African context, the animals that they are most concerned about are often the elephants because they are so massive, they eat so much forage, they are destructive to you know, people's villages, you know, if not properly managed, all of those sort of things. And so he believed that elephants were the ultimate problem. And essentially, he did a bunch of research and calculations and came to the conclusion that, hey, we need to cull a large amount of the elephants in Rhodesia. And what that will do is that will allow the land to do its own thing. That'll let nature take its course and regenerate back to, func back to proper ecosystem function. Well, as it turns out, that was not the case. And they culled 40,000 elephants, uh, not under Alan's watch. It was after his research was published. But the government did implement that program over a period of years. And the land continued to get worse. And so he holds that experience as the greatest regret of his entire life. Um, knowing that all of those lives of those animals were lost due to the wrong decision. And so he set out to make it his life's work to figure out what is it that a landscape needs and what caused not just the, ecological, the continued ecological degradation of the land, but what is it about the thinking that led to that decision to be made in the first place. Because there are practices that people put into place, but ultimately practices are put into place by people. And so it's our, it's our mindset, it's how we view the world, and it's how we make decisions that ultimately is the root cause of these issues that we're facing. So he studied it deeply. He looked at the various dynamics. He started to figure out some of these inherent truths of a landscape, one being that predator-prey connection that we were talking about, whether it's bison and wolves, or we're talking wildebeest and lions, whatever it may be, predator and prey have always coexisted. Grasslands and grazers have always coexisted. There is also an aspect of overgrazing being a function of time, not a number of animals. So like I was saying, it doesn't matter if a, well, I guess I wasn't saying this, I was going to earlier, and I think I got sidetracked, but if an animal is left in a certain place for too long, what they're going to do is they're going to go back to the most palatable grasses, and they're going to continuously bite that same grass species. And what that's going to do is it's going to overgraze that grass. And at the same time, they're going to be neglecting the less palatable grasses. And so those are going to die off as well. So if free choice is given to animals, they're going to overgraze the more palatable grasses. They're going to undergraze the less palatable grasses. The overgrazed ones are going to die off because their root structures are going to be sloughed off because of the grazing events. The undergrazed grasses aren't just going to turn brown because of a lack of moisture. They're going to eventually turn gray and black, and they're going to oxidize. They're going to chemically oxidize back into the atmosphere and release more CO2. So if you, the, the way that you get around this, though, is if you herd the animals, they're less selective of which grasses they're going to graze. And so that's one of the key insights that Alan figured out is that the herd effect is important not just for the movement of those animals across a migratory corridor in the different landscapes, but the behavior that they exhibit when they are in a herd. You know, if you're in a buffet line and you come across, you know, you're the only person in the buffet line, I should say, and you come across a buffet, you're going to have your choice of whatever you want. But if you're elbow to elbow with a ton of people, you know, conference just got out and there's barely anything there, you're going to grab the quickest things you can find. You're like, I got to eat. I can't be as selective. The same thing can be said for animals in a herd. They're also a little, uh, when they are in a herd, they are more likely to trample down grasses. They're not as selective of where they're placing their hooves. And so that trampling down of grasses is really important because what that does is it creates what's called litter at the ground level. And so grasses that have been trampled down into litter create a natural mulch on that landscape. And that natural mulch 
it slows the velocity of raindrops before they hit the ground, so there's less likely for erosion to occur. And also, it creates a more hospitable, cooler environment so that moisture isn't as easily um, uh, left out of the landscape. So there's those pieces. And another one of the critical pieces that he learned was what we call brittleness. And so what that essentially is referring to is the distribution of moisture year round. Here in Colorado, we have a very distinct growing season and dormant season. You know, the grasses don't stay green year round. They turn brown, you know, usually where I am in the front range in August, and they stay brown until the spring when you've got the snow that melts off. In coastal areas, there's year round available moisture. Things stay green year round. The reason that's important is because when you have available moisture all the time, decomposition of vegetation can naturally occur. You can decay grasses into the ground. Microbes can decay life very easily. In a dry and brittle landscape, the only place where decomposition of vegetation can happen biologically is in the rumen of a livestock, that fourth chamber of a livestock's stomach. Well, it's actually the first one of four. But the rumen is essentially that fermentation vat inside of a cow or a sheep or whatever it may be. And that's where they're biologically breaking down the vegetation and depositing it into fertility that can then cycle through the landscape. So without grazing herbivores on a landscape, nutrients aren't going to cycle back into that landscape. And those grasses are just going to stay standing and eventually are going to turn gray and black and they're going to chemically oxidize. We don't want chemical oxidation of our vegetation. We want biological breakdown. And so in a rainforest, yeah, biological decay is going to happen naturally all over the place. In dry, arid, brittle landscapes like much of the American West, you have to have livestock to break down that vegetation and to cycle those nutrients. And so when you see a lot of these conversations saying, well, cows are destroying the planet, we need to get rid of all of our livestock, the question I ask and I say, okay, well, if you don't want to eat animals, that is totally fine. Everyone has their own decision to make there. But what are you going to do with the 12 and a half billion acres of grasslands globally? How are you going to ensure the ecosystem function there if there is no livestock and there's no rumens to biologically break down that vegetation and keep those nutrients cycling through the ecosystem? Um, and so that's one of the key pieces that Alan um, you know, has brought into the planning process. And what that means in practical terms is we plan our grazing in the growing season different than we plan our grazing in the non-growing season because of the availability of forage and you know, the photosynthesis happening and all these other pieces that I won't get into now. But it's an important piece for management decisions. Yes, other question. There is another question. Thank you. And by the way, that was a wonderful presentation of, of holistic resource management. So thank, thank you. you so much. I wanted to ask you, but also wanted to tell you that Alan Savory was actually here in 1992. <laughs> and we all met at the Baca Ranch because we were talking about a trans basin diversion proposal. And he was working with George Whitten at the time. And so we all met, and he tried to convince AWDI, using the logic that you just presented to them, to get them to understand how they were going to devastate the landscape. Needless to say, it didn't go anywhere. But it was brilliant. I mean, he really, really tried to get them to understand that they had to take care of the landscape, because they owned the ranch at the time. So, um, but what I wanted to ask you is, um, and it's a bit of a loaded question, but um, do you think human beings are good managers? Well, to the, to the story that you were telling about Alan being here in 92, I love that, and I only bring that up because I have Alan's 35 millimeter slides in my basement 
the project I'm working on is getting all of his old historical slides from back in the day scanned. Uh, he recently wrote a memoir, and so we're trying to get all the photographic evidence of it. So I might have photos of that. So I'm going to go home and look through. If I find them, I'll get them to Anya so she can distribute through the community so you can and, see And that. it might be 91, uh, but it's either 91 Whitten, or 90. I yeah. think it was early 92, yeah. though. Okay, I'm yeah. going to look for that. Your question, is it, is the question, are humans good managers or can humans be good managers? Let, let's go with number two. Number two, <laughs> yes, <positive>. absolutely. <laughs> that, I think, is, it's, we need to have some humility and just understand that we are a part of nature, we are not above it, we can't exert this top-down control on everything. And when we surrender control and we listen to the ecosystem, we, we look to see, okay, I tried this, is it working, yes or no? And look at that in a variety of contexts. You know, do ecological monitoring on your landscape so that you can see, hey, is my soil carbon improving? Is my water holding capacity improving? Am I improving biodiversity or decreasing it? You know, what's the structure of the different species communities that exist on my landscape? If we approach our management from a sense of curiosity and wanting to do the right thing, but knowing we might not get it right, uh, but we're still committed to moving in the right direction, I think absolutely we can be good managers. And I think that speaks to maybe the, some of the problems that Alan had. So back in the early 90s, you know, Alan had only been out on the scene talking about holistic management for maybe 10, 15 years at that point. At that time, there wasn't a lot of evidence or a lot of examples to point to. And so it was easy for people to go, ah, you're a charlatan, you're a snake oil salesman. There's no evidence supporting what you're doing. We know exactly what we're doing when it comes to livestock management. Well, in 2023, people are singing a very different tune. There, is a, there has been a groundswell in recent years of peer-reviewed evidence, which is what those academics have been asking for for decades, saying, hey, Alan, you don't have the evidence to support what you're saying. Well, now we do. Evidence shows that you can increase your stocking rate and your productivity of your landscape, you know, often by 400% has been reported in multiple studies. You can sequester two to seven tons of carbon per hectare per year, and you scale that over five billion hectares. You can improve water holding capacity by X percent. There's so much evidence now and so many case studies of people who are thriving because of this and have been doing it now for decades because they believed in Alan in the early days. And they were like, you know, this guy's crazy, but the way we're doing things isn't working, so what do I have to lose aside from the ranch and everything I have? Let me, let me see if I can do things better. And the people that gave him a chance have are now seen as these award-winning land managers that are, you know, winning conservation awards and being featured in documentaries, and it's who people are looking up to because they've decided to go a different route and try things differently, and it's meant all the world, and it has made all the difference in not just their land, but also the livelihoods for them and everyone in their community. If I might share uh, uh, a couple that went through Alan Savory's program, prob actually starting in the 90s, um, and uh, they were the largest uh, landowners in Rio Grande County, and so they had a lot of places to really experiment. Um, but what they came away with, which I always found to be really inspiring, is that we don't raise cattle. We, we raise grasses, mm -hmm. and cattle is a byproduct. Yep. Yeah. Anyway. yeah, it's that mindset shift of controlling the output. Hey, I'm trying to sell beef or milk or wool or whatever it is. No, you're a steward of the landscape. You grow grass, so you do what you do to care for that land to the best of your ability. And if you do, you will be rewarded downstream. We have another question, sure. but I just wanted to add something. Mm -hmm. uh, having seen Alan's lectures from the old days, I just happened to find those in the last few years, and I was really inspired. But in light of the last question, like how can we, mm -hmm. it, I thought it was so powerful that he had the experience, and, I, and maybe you brought this up earlier, I apologize if I wasn't here, about the elephants, mm -hmm. and how he had to learn after error 
you yeah. know, and, and, and of course we don't want to have to do that, but certainly sometimes that's the best teacher, yeah. you know, is to realize what you thought was true is not really the case, and I need to look for something else, so. Yeah, yeah, Thank and you. so I, I was speaking about the elephants earlier, but right. yeah, you are absolutely right that sometimes a, a slice of humble pie is exactly what we need um, and can be the greatest teacher, for sure. And it's what set him on the course of trying to figure this all out, which has now allowed us, you know, Savory Institute, we started the organization in 2009. We've trained some 22,000 land managers who manage themselves 79 million acres. And so, you know, that wouldn't be possible unless he acknowledged the error in his ways in those right. early days in Africa. Right, thank you. Yeah. All right, last question, because I think... We're at time. Hi, I'm Justin. Uh, have you worked with any co-owned uh, ranches? Because ranches are very expensive. I think the more we can share and make it accessible to normal people to get involved, the better practices will spread faster. Yeah. Thank you. So in terms of the question is co-owned ranches, on a ranch side of things, not really. Just because land ownership is so black and white in the US and land values are so incredibly expensive. But in a setting like Kenya or Zimbabwe, where there is communal land ownership, we work with those subsistence farming communities, um, and it works incredibly well. And so in those contexts, all the individual families within a village uh, own livestock. That's just traditionally what they do. And instead of everyone competing for the same grass and uh, ultimately overgrazing those landscapes, with the holistic management framework, what they often end up doing is combining all their animals into one large communal herd and then moving those animals according to a grazing plan. And what that allows you to do is introduce recovery periods to the landscape so the land can actually have a break and respond and regenerate. And so it works incredibly well in those communal settings, but that works because the different families are able to come together and say, okay, all of our animals are here together. This is the strategy. This is the plan. These are the people that are going to be the herders. They get employment out of that. It actually frees up man hours for other people so that they don't have to manage their four cows and a goat now. Now they just put their animals into the herd, and now they can go do other things, care for their family, raise other crops, whatever it may be. So um, in the American context, no, I guess there's not as much communal land ownership, but one thing I would say is land ownership isn't absolutely necessary to be able to manage animals. There are people that run contract grazing operations where they have a herd of animals and they are hired by people to come manage their landscape. Um, and these animals don't even have to be for food production. There's a, a gal that I really like out in Ojai, California, Brittany Cole Bush. She runs an operation called Shepherdess Land and Livestock. And what she does is she grazes sheep and goats throughout the municipality of Ojai, California, and she does that to reduce the fuel load of all of that vegetation that's otherwise standing and creating a fire hazard. So she's out grazing for fire mitigation. So she's providing that as a service to the municipality, and the municipality is charging her for her ecosystem services that she's providing to them. So instead of them hiring lawn mowers or whatever it is to come out and mow, she's bringing out her herds and grazing. And so she owns land and she can manage that, uh, but she doesn't own that land specifically. And so there are creative ways in which people are able to either run contract grazing operations or even for many young people getting into agriculture, just finding leases. Uh, you know, you don't have to own land. There are plenty of old farmers and ranchers who are just tired and they don't want to do the work themselves anymore and they would be happy to lease their land out and have a steady income and let a young couple get a stab at it. And ultimately, you know, down the road, chances are they're going to get a chance to buy that land and maybe they need to build up some savings to do so. But if you establish yourself on that property, you're most likely going to have the first right of refusal when that piece of land comes on the market. Great. Yeah, there's a, there's a group called the National Young Farmers Coalition. They do a lot of work connecting 
young agrarians in with uh, landowners and lessees that are interested in bringing the younger generation and giving them access to land. So that's a resource that I'd encourage folks to check out. Um, okay, well, that is all. Thank you all for listening. And, um, you know, if you leave here with one thing is, uh, you know, give some love to the grass. Thanks. Yay. Thank you, Bobby. It was a great talk.